this invitation, and this is a joint paper with Jorge Rodriguez from University of Chicago and Sergio Ursula from Maryland University. So, um, let's see, here we go. As you might know, uh, Chile is one of the most unequal countries in the world. So here you have the countries um, in the OECD group, and as you can see, Chile rank as the top of the countries with very high income inequality. And here you have a similar information using per capita income by Santile uh, using CASEN, which is the Chilean household data set in 1990 and 19, uh, 2011 uh, in, real, in real pesos from 2011. And this picture is quite interesting, in my opinion, because um, if you exclude, for, for example, the top 5% of the distribution in Chile, Chile is quite an uh, equal country, and the Gini coefficient is about Germany. However, if you include this top fraction of the income distribution, okay, Chile became one of the more unequal countries in the world. So basically, the action is here. If you want to understand the inequality and the pattern of inequality in Chile, you have to pay attention on what, the, what is happening in the top of the income distribution. So here is coming, uh, this picture is coming from, the, the, from this project, Atkinson, Piketty, and Saez, and uh, show the participation of the top 1% of the income distribution in 2010. And you see here Chile is about 25%, uh, the top 1% concentrate about 25% of the total income in Chile, uh, which is uh, extremely unequal. 20%, we, we already learned that Ecuador exceeds 20% here and Denmark, Sweden is about 7% over here. So, I mean, in any metrics, Chile is a very unequal country. So, the key questions for, for these papers are what are the underlying causes of this? What is the role of the schooling system? And have educational policies impact in any way in the labor market later on, okay? So, this is the, the basic question from, from this presentation. And in and in one slide, I, I, I would try to explain how the Chilean educational system works because it's going to be important to understand the, the, the next issues in, in, in this presentation. So in 1981, uh, 1981 uh, the military government in Chile established a voucher scheme. Okay? And as a consequence of that, uh, nowadays we have three types of schools. We have public school, voucher school, and private paid school. And voucher school concentrate about 54% of the total enrollment in Chile today. So uh, in addition to that, uh, the voucher school are allowed to charge a copayment for families. So you apply for this kind of school. The school, in addition to the subsidy provided by the state, the school can charge an additional fee to the family. Uh, also this type of school are allowed to select students. So usually this kind of school, what they do is to select the smartest uh, students and also the richest one in order to uh, obtain the, the better student to be educated. Uh, finally, these schools can run for profit or not for profit. So there is a huge discussion on this issue today in Chile. There is an educational reform on, on the, under discussion. But anyway, this is the situation today. Uh, there is a large evidence on the school choice and educational achievement using data on mainly on education. And according to this data, a public school and voucher school are quite similar in terms of educational outcome when you control for family background and income and stuff like that. And there is a clear advantage of the private paid school with respect to the public one. However, uh, this previous evidence is limited by data. Most of the data is coming from cross-section data, so it's very difficult to properly identify causal effects. This table is to show you a little bit about the, the, the consequence of this uh, educational segmentation. Here you have public school, private voucher school, and private fee-paying school. And these are the standardized tests in language and in mathematics, okay? And as you can see here, uh, this test score increases, okay, according to this type of school. So 
So public school obtained like uh, 240 points in, in this test in language, private voucher school 256, and private fee paying school uh, 275, and the same parallel is shown for mathematics. So in this paper, we're going to use a, um, a new data set for Chile with a panel data. And basically, we're, we are trying to argue in the paper that because we can control for pre-labor marketabilities and individual social characteristics during the high school, we can better explain the contribution of each type of school in terms of, not now in terms of educational outcome, but in terms of impact or outcomes in the labor market. So, so we argue that we have here a better identification strategy. So uh, the main results, you want to leave now? Uh, this, this is the main result. We find a clear link between individual high school type, public voucher, and private, and the labor market outcomes. Uh, particularly, private fee pay in school have a higher return in the labor market later on. We also are going to mention a little bit about two educational policies who are, uh, which are very important in Chile. The one is the extension of the school day, and the other one is a teacher incentive. Uh, both of them try to improve and increase the quality of education in Chile. However, we found no effect in terms of labor market outcomes. Okay, so we spent a lot of money with no real impact in terms of outcomes in the labor market. So, uh, papers investigating uh, income inequality, there is a lot, most of them cross-sectional data, more recently some cohort studies, but no much using this kind of panel data. Um, so this is the first paper trying to link data on individual schooling and labor market outcomes. Uh, we argue that this allows us to study the origin of inequality for a recent cohort, and uh, this paper follow a previous literature mainly done by Jane Heckman from University of Chicago. So you can see the more the, the, the empirical strategy and the algebra in the paper with more details, but at the end of the day, we come out with a model like this, a reduced form model, in which we are going to explain a labor market outcome, which are earnings okay, in period T bar, Okay, period T bar is going to be 2011. Okay, that's, that's, we're, we're going to observe earnings in 2011, this T bar. And this earning are, is going to be a function of a vector of exogenous characteristic, school characteristic, family background, um, individual's ability, and public policy. All these coverages are going to be measured at a particular period before 2011, and in particular, is going to be in 2001. So we have a panel data, same individual, 2001, when they were 15 years old. We have all the family characteristics. We have an ability test measured by this uh, standardized test in mathematics and uh, uh, Spanish. And then we're going to observe the same guy, same individuals in 2011. Uh, you may believe that education in terms of level and school choice is not exogenous, actually it's endogenous. That's the problem with the previous literature because they are using only cross-section. You may think, for instance, that the wealth of families or a parent with more education or a maybe the school choice is correlated with a, the ability of the students. So all these factors can be controlled in this analysis because uh, we are controlling by family background in the past and also for individual abilities. So uh, we, we can reduce substantially the, selection, the potential selection bias uh, by using panel data, I mean exploiting this uh, cross-section variation and also the time series variation. So let me talk a little bit about the data. The data, uh, uh, in the data we observe the test score at the age of 15 and this information comes from the measurement system for education quality, SIMSE, which is the standardized national test. Okay? So this test, uh, we have this data set for 10 graders, people at the age of 15. Okay? Uh, we define our exogenous characteristic vector, QI, 
including age, age square, gender, previous attendance to early education, FI include mother and father education, family income and number of books at home, and, and disabilities include the language and math test score, and we also have a variable indicating if the student repeat uh, a previous course. We observe student earnings 10 years from the time they took SIMSE, I mean in 2011, okay? And we link the educational data set with um, the unemployment insurance database using the national identification number for each individual. So we were able to match the data, okay? And in, and in this way, we, go, we build this, this panel data. So, of course, we have problems. I mean, that's, that, that's the, that's, initial uh, case for uh, empirical work. We have since a database for this sample, which is, uh, uh, that's the sample for students. However, our analysis is based only in 78,000 individuals. So, just to clarify the situation, we drop students from the database which, with missing values in some of the coverage from since database. Then, uh, we consider only students affiliated to an employment insurance system, which are formal workers, okay? So this study is gonna be relevant only for formal workers. We don't have informal workers at the age of 25 or 26 years old. And we leave also information with not zero total 2011 earnings in our final sample. So I know you might be worried because of all this selection process. However, as you can see here, this is the original data with the whole sample. And this is the sample that we are using actually here after linking the data. Uh, and, and as we expect, the earnings are much higher for this group than, than for this group because we're selecting people who are actually working in the labor market. So this is a problem. However, in terms of the other covariate, age, the, the, the mean for this group is 26 years old and for this group, for this sample is 26 years old, okay? And the test score in language is 251, 251. In math, 246, 247. Percentage attending public school, 48%, 48.6, and so on. So pretty much the sample are no bias because of the selection process. So just to motivate the discussion, here you have the model education and the relationship with the same set score and, earn, and future earnings. And as you can expect, uh, modern education is possibly positively correlated with higher results in math, language, and earnings. So here you have the score when your mother has primary education, two, 30 points, and almost uh, 300 points when your mother has university education. And the same pattern is for language, and the same pattern is observed for monthly earnings. Here you have the non-parametric relationship between the mathematic test score, so that's the, that's the score of the test. A good score is about here, like 350. That's a pretty, pretty good score, okay? And this is the earnings from the same individual. So here you have the panel data, okay? So that's the score in mathematics. That's the earnings from the same set of individuals. This, this is when this individual has a 15 years old, and this is when they have uh, 26 years old, okay? So we can learn three things from this figure. First of all, there is a positive relationship between mathematics score and earnings. So math is quite important. That's a good thing, all right? Second, there is no much difference between public school and voucher school. You see? I mean, these two lines are very close. There is no much difference in terms of future earnings. Finally, there is a significant difference between these two types of school and private fee paying school, especially for the high score in mathematics. You see, I mean, the action is not here. Most of the action is about here, okay? And this is quite interesting because if you wanna uh, uh, enroll to your kid in this kind of school in order to gain, you know, this gap, this type of school are quite expensive, uh, and this is going to be a key issue for
for, for the conclusion of the paper. So, if you run the regression, the, the earnings re regression, you can see here, I mean, here you are controlling, let's concentrate here in a specification number seven, we're controlling for uh, all the exogenous characteristics we mentioned before, family background, previous performance, policy levels, policy with interaction, etc. This is the sample size. And we can see here that if you, if you attend to a voucher school, you obtain almost three extra points, 3% in terms of earnings with respect to attending a public school. If you attend a, a private fee a school, you obtain 15% more. So a high return to attending a private fee school. And also, uh, this is interesting, I mean, uh, the gain for a higher scoring language is 1.4% and for math is, uh, is 14%, okay? So there is a match gain for, for an extra point in mathematics rather than in Spanish. So when you control by the average since at the school level, try to capture something like a peer effect or so on, you can see that the voucher school the results are quite similar for the voucher school is the gains for attending voucher school is about 4% here. And private fee pay in school is 7% rather than 15, but you have to add the effect of the school level, I mean, for, for, the, for the bid effect. But pretty much the, 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 the conclusion on the difference between public and voucher school remains. I mean, there is a, a small gain in the voucher school with respect to the public school. So then we examine two educational policies, as I mentioned before, first of all, the full school day program. So there was an increase in the school, the school day program for the kids. They, att they usually attend from 8 o'clock to 1 p.m. After the reform, they attend from 8 p.m. to 4 p.m. Okay, so there was an increase in the number of hours of lecture at school. That's the HEC, or full school day program. And the second was the National System for School Performance Assessment, which is a teacher incentive. If the school performs better, then teachers are paid a bonus, okay? So let me skip this. So when you analyze the effect of the extension of the school uh, day, you, you see no effect. The parameter is not significant in terms of future earnings. And also when you interact the extension of the school day with public school, with voucher school, there is no gain. The only gain, again, is obtained by student attending private paid school. When you analyze the same for the teaching incentive scheme, there is no significant effect. Only you observe a positive and significant effect when the school earns this uh, bonus three times in a row, okay? Which represents about 3% of the schools. So again, uh, this policy does not create a big, a big change in terms of uh, outcomes. So when you interact the, the, the incentive scheme with type of school, again, the only benefits are kids attending voucher school when the school uh, was benefited by this scheme three times in a row. So let me finish before the, you know, <laughs> the ring, exactly. The main conclusion uh, is when you're controlling for exogenous characteristics, ability and family background, we document that different type of school produce different future labor outcomes uh, on a student. Most of the action uh, is given by private high school with more than 300 points. Uh, we show a higher uh, return to educational expenses, uh, expenses and there is something like an international, uh, intergenerational transmission of inequality. Elites begets elites, okay? That's pretty much the conclusion. And in addition to that, educational policies uh, are not working, are not working in terms of closing the gap between public education and private education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.